Hi everyone. Uh, today my guest is Gabe Buckley, National President of the Liberal Democrats, who is um, uh, who's written an article for Liberty Works uh, about cannabis legalization. So the title is "Cannabis: Just Legalize It Already." So, Gabe, would you like to give us a rundown about what your article is about? Well, basically, it. it travels down a number of different threads and then basically weaves those threads together to present a, a fairly comprehensive case as to why cannabis should not remain illegal uh, given that there are other drugs such as alcohol and tobacco that objectively cause a great deal more harm in society. However, we still allow adults to make up their own mind about them and go and purchase them legally and consume them, you know, in, in their own homes and in places reserved for that purpose. So uh, given that cannabis is nowhere near as harmful as alcohol or tobacco, there uh, is no reasoning along those lines to keep it illegal because, mm. yes, it, it might not be 100% safe and... Uh, very little in this world is, but uh, it's objectively more safe than a number of other things that we regularly allow adults to use. In fact, you know, TV advertising is is fairly well saturated with uh, ads for alcoholic beverages. Uh, it's it's something that is is not hidden from us. It, it's almost actively encouraged in Australian society to uh, get out there and have a beer. Um, so, given given that. And given the number of people that die from alcohol-related uh, causes each year uh, and the fact that cannabis has never killed anyone, there really isn't a lot of uh, room for the, oh, no, it's dangerous, we can't let people try that argument. Yes, uh, I, I'm a little worried that when we point out the logical inconsistencies of this, it will just create um, the demand for prohibition on alcohol rather than rather than the other way around with some people. Uh, yeah, well, with some people maybe, but I think Australian culture is pretty much uh, robust enough to say, uh, no, you're not touching our beer. Well, the first part of your article touches on what Australian attitudes are on this issue. So you've written nearly half of all Australian electors are in favour of legalising cannabis, as a recent survey by the Australian National University shows. 43% of respondents are in favour of legislation and only 32% believe cannabis should remain criminalised. So, um, so basically, a majority of Australians either support legalisation or of cannabis or don't know, whereas only, you know, only 32% are a, are a solid no on this issue. Um, uh, and as you've pointed out, um, uh, pointed out that the the studies show the studies show that the the harm from cannabis is is uh, less than than other drugs. And I made a note here that um, when I read that that I don't think people in the community necessarily understand that because um, a lot of people have had experience of knowing someone who's abused cannabis um, uh, and their stories of people getting drug-induced psychosis um, from from abuse of cannabis. So so what's your, um, what would be your response to people who raise those objections? Well, look, all, all drugs affect uh, different people differently. There are, you only need to go down to a casualty ward on a Friday or Saturday night to see a whole bunch of people who have uh, you know, abused alcohol to the point where they've gotten into fights or uh, done stupid things that uh, have caused them uh, real injuries. Uh, you could go down and, and spend weeks at a casualty ward before you came came across anybody who was under the influence of cannabis who'd done something that had caused them grief. So uh, while, you know, there are, are certainly um, anecdotal evidence that, that points to, you know, some people having adverse reactions to cannabis, it, it's certainly nowhere near as prevalent as people uh, overusing alcohol to the point of doing something stupid. So, you know, I... I wouldn't recommend it for everybody. I would certainly recommend that most people try it. 
a little bit first and see uh, how it works for them, much as the same way as I would recommend that people try a small amount of alcohol first and then see how it works for them. Yes, yes, and and perhaps by um, it becoming legalised, um, there'll be more of an effort in identifying those people who who actually can't handle can't handle the drug and, and should avoid it. Where when it's um, when it's criminalised, then it, it's very hard to very hard to do that and to treat those people. It is. We're in in very much a chicken and egg type situation with that where. You know, we really do need to do more research into into the effects, and uh, it would be great to have a very complete picture of the way that cannabis affects the human body and the human brain. But we can't do that research until it becomes legalised, and well, certainly not to the extent that we need to. And the ability to you know for people to be open and honest about their cannabis use is is compromised by the fact that. You know, people are worried that they'll attract attention from the police. Yes, yes. Uh, now, another issue that you've uh, brought up in your article is, of course, the medical usage. So this is uh, one area where in, uh, in Australia we are st seeing small progress um, for medical usage. So would you like to outline the case for medical usage of marijuana and where we're at as a country on that issue? Yeah, well, cannabis has been used both medicinally and recreationally by humanity for, well, at least 5,000 years. The, uh, the, the writing about it goes back about 5,000 years to about 3,000 BC. Um, for, for about 100 of those years, it's been illegal to use cannabis medicinally. And uh, we are very much starting to see the error of that now as the, uh, the research comes in and the demonstrated efficacy of, of cannabis in treating things like uh, epilepsy in kids, uh, helping uh, older folk with Parkinson's, uh, everything from glaucoma through to, uh, you know, assisting with the nausea associated with chemotherapy and all those sort of things. It, it's uh, very much at a point now where we cannot argue against the medical efficacy of cannabis. And at the moment, yes, some of Australia's governments are making some small steps towards uh, legalising uh, medicinal cannabis, mm. um, but they are also continuing to uh, you know, prosecute people who are preparing things like cannabis tinctures and, uh, and those sort of things for uh, medicinal purposes. Really, uh, if you just, you know, if you bring in any sort of overarching legislative framework about cannabis, whether it's for medicinal cannabis or this, you know, regulate and tax approach to recreational cannabis, mm. all you really do is shift the goalposts and it becomes a matter of instead of being arrested for possession, you get arrested for possession without a permit. Instead mm. of getting arrested for cultivation, you get arrested for, arrested for cultivation without a license. It doesn't change a great deal for the average person on the street. Whereas if we were to simply legalise recreational cannabis, for which there are no real arguments against, medicinal cannabis simply takes care of itself. And yes, instead of yes, GP yes. saying, hey, why don't you try a chamomile tea before you go to bed? They'll say, hey, why don't you try a cannabis infusion before you go to bed? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, put it this way. I mean, if I if I've got a bad back and I don't want to be hooked on op opioids, um, uh, you know, it's pretty unlikely, even with all the progress being made on the medical front, that at this stage you know, I'd be able to get access access to it un under any kind of medical regime. That it's going to take a very um, that it's still very regulated and most people who need it for some kind of medical usage, um, you know, unless they tick a particular box, are probably still going to source it illegally as, as it is at the moment. Yes. Yes, no, it, it's quite bizarre that uh, even though all of the evidence that we have points to this being a, a very safe way to treat things like back pain, uh, various governments around the country still have this opinion that it's it's such a dangerous drug that we can only give it to people who are going to die anyway. Yes, yes. It, it's uh, quite ridiculous. And, you know, it would be far simpler 
if you did throw your back out tomorrow for you just to uh, ring around a few friends and uh, say who can get me some cannabis because it's you know it's pretty common out there yeah yes uh well uh, this uh this actually your last comment ties in very nicely with the next point i was going to bring up with you which is um uh, which is the quote from Milton Friedman, uh, Nobel Prize winner Milton Friedman, uh, once said that if you look at the drug war from a purely economic point of view, the role of the government is to protect the drug cartels. Um, and and so this, this is the situation that we have, that as you pointed out, cannabis is very easily available. You know, the, 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 the state has had very little... Uh, affected being able to um, prevent people getting it so probably all the social issues that come from cannabis we probably already have legalizing it probably wouldn't wouldn't open you know wouldn't increase that very much because it's so easy to get anyway mm -hmm. um, uh, but what it does do is it, it stops a, a proper market operating and forces um, normal people to have to deal with the criminal element in society just to access this this uh, good, this product that they want to purchase. Correct. Uh, yeah. yeah if, if I was to, um, you know, grab a few pounds of uh, weed and go and set up a stall at the local Sunday markets, the police would be onto me in a flash. I'd be arrested, I'd be uh, thrown in jail and, uh, you know, taken before a magistrate and uh, asked to account for my actions. Uh, whereas if somebody wants to, you know, deal cannabis in the in the shadows and that you know go to the extent of uh, you know arming themselves to protect that trade it generally takes the police a lot more time and effort to a find them and and b uh, shut them down so what you have what you end up having is is the police go after the low hanging fruit they fill their quotas for arrests and uh, you know drug crime arrests and the police commissioners can point to all these arrests happening but they're usually not the bad people they're uh, you know they they might be you know people selling a couple of ounces to their friends just to cover their own usage or uh, you know people making tinctures for for uh, arthritis sufferers or there'll, there'll be people who are sort of operating on the margins of uh, of the criminal side of it but not uh, not what we would think of as, you know, drug kingpins and stuff. Those people are all well protected behind their own walls of, uh, of violence and uh, protection and subterfuge, and the police have a great deal of trouble actually bringing those people down. Yes. So it becomes an arms race, you know. The, the more you don't want to get caught, the more deeply you have to invest yourself in criminality to avoid, you know, being thrown in jail for setting up a market stall. <laughs> Yes, yes, and of course, um, you know, there's been plenty of cases where the police have themselves been been bought off by by these uh, you know, drug drug cartels. Um, yeah, and there are, there are plenty of cases of the police dealing drugs too. <laughs> oh yes, yes, um, and so what? Uh, and you say in your article that one we spend one point five billion dollars annually trying to enforce. Um, our drug laws mm -hmm. um, and opening it up to the market would destroy would destroy the uh, drug um, the drug cartels overnight. <laughs> Pretty much, cost us yeah. nothing. <laughs> well, cost yeah, a, a lot of people uh, are only using drugs like uh, methamphetamine and uh, and others in that vein because yeah, you know, they're easier for. You know, organized crime syndicates to produce and to transport and uh, and to sell you know a million dollars worth of pills might take up you know a, a small amount of your boot space a million dollars worth of cannabis you're going to need a truck yes and, yes uh, you know, it, it's not uh, it, it, it's not something that is very easily moved around in secret you know the stuff smells like crazy and it, it's bulky <laughs> and uh, you know, it's, it's a very difficult drug to be secretive about, whereas things like methamphetamine uh, are much more convenient for organised crime. And mm. people are really only turning to them because, you know, that's what their drug dealers are selling them. But if, if they can access a, a legal and safe 
uh, supply of, of cannabis, if they can go down to the local dispensary or if they can grow it in their backyard or if they have a friend who can grow it in their backyard, then, yeah, there's, there's no reason for them to come into contact with people who are the, the front line for an organised crime syndicate who have a vested interest in getting these people taking harder drugs that are more convenient for the organised crime syndicates. Yes, yes. And um, on, on the notion of pills, just to get a little off topic, but um, uh, that uh, they keep banning all of the sort of uh, alternatives that the market comes up to for people taking hard drugs. You know, I, a couple of years ago, there was those products on the market, um, uh, you know, that would give people a bit of a high. And yes. um, I forget, I, you know, I'm not really immersed in the drug culture, so I, I'm not that familiar with it. But I, I remember that they were around and for a little while they were legal, at least semi-legal, and then they and then they banned them all. So so they kind of destroyed that market, well, kind of like what they're doing with vaping and for just regular tobacco. Yes, um, yeah. Just, um, you know, something that's probably safer to people actually taking hard drugs um yeah so and probably yeah, so yeah some, sorry go some on. time ago they introduced some fairly ridiculous catch-all legislation that uh, said that any substance that contained or was analogous to or purported to be analogous to any legis uh, scheduled drug should be treated in the same way as that scheduled drug so you suddenly had, you know, any sort of herbal smoking blend that was kind of like cannabis was suddenly as illegal as cannabis. And uh, a lot of the uh, the proliferation of those smoking blends uh, came about because of the, um, you know, drug testing regimes, which would pick up cannabis but wouldn't pick up these other blends. Right. Uh, right. So... Uh, yeah, when the the government started cracking down on on all of those, and one of the the most ridiculous uh, side effects of that legislation was that wattle seeds, which contain DMT, uh, <laughs> would technically be illegal under the uh, the laws that the government's brought in. So, you know, if you were to you know sell a bag of oregano to some high school kids pretending it was weed, you'd be treated the same as if you'd sold them weed. It's kind of ridiculous the way the government is is sort of cracking down on anybody who you know just wants to have a bit of fun, really. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, right now, uh, we'll get to your um, uh, the next point you made, which is very interesting. That the annual market for illegal drugs in Australia is valued at seventeen billion dollars. So this is really the tax mm -hmm. and revenue tax and revenue argument at the moment it's costing us 1.5 billion dollars to police this stuff yep. um there's a shadow economy of um 17 billion dollars and you say that um in colorado where of course it's been um uh, legalized um the uh there was a drop in violent crime of 5.2 percent and a drop of overall crime in 10.1 percent of the first year uh -huh. because everyone was so so mallow it would seem and um and then but back to the revenue point of view that in the first four months of it operating they raised 10 million dollars in state taxes from mm -hmm. from just the normal taxes you'd put on um uh put on uh products and you know, i guess yes, similar well, to they, even, if we just, even if we just slapped our 10 uh, percent gst on that 17 billion dollars that's 1.7 billion dollars Yes, yeah. So that's out of money. Yeah, that's that's um, that's a huge um, you know, that's a, a um, dramatically reducing our need for policing, um, mm. raising revenue. There's not a lot of evidence, as you pointed out very well in the article, that by legalizing it, it creates any increased demand for these products because it's actually not that hard to get them anyway. Well, that's it. 99.9% .9 of Australians who want to use cannabis are already using cannabis. They're just doing it under the threat of being arrested. Yes, yes. It's only it's only squares like me who don't don't know any cool people who um, who might have trouble. Um, so, uh, and you bring up the, of course, the important case in Portugal uh, where 
um, all drugs were decriminalised. So this is a slightly different argument. This is the decriminalisation argument. Um, death from drug overdoses have fallen. Drug usage rates have fallen. Drug-related HIV cases have also fallen. Portu and then you say Portugal has not yet uh, decriminalised the supply side um, and is not um, getting the benefit of... Um, you know the tax revenue we just mentioned mm. because it's just not legal um yes. yeah so um so would you like to say a bit more about the portugal experience and what we can learn from it yes well it was uh, some time ago in portugal and they de decriminalized all personal drug use so mm. it doesn't matter whether it's cannabis or heroin or methamphetamine if you're caught with a, a small amount and it's a fairly generous small amount in Portugal. It's, it's quite a reasonable personal use amount. Uh, then that is, is treated as not being a crime. Um, it potentially be treated as a health issue if, if you happen to be addicted to some of those substances. Cannabis, of course, is not addictive, uh, but some others are. So they, they're treating addiction as a health issue rather than as the criminal act. And they are very much seeing the benefits of that. And one of the really strange benefits is that the use of drugs by teenagers and, and children, as by minors in general, has just fallen more dramatically than the rates of use by adults because, you know, it ain't cool anymore if our parents are doing it. <laughs> That's right. It's the Facebook effect. Uh, yeah. When you... When you're, um... Uh, when your grandmother nudges you on Facebook, you... The, the, then it's you know, time to switch to Instagram. <laughs> yeah, right. when your dad gets on Instagram, you go to Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> so when, you're, um, when your grandmother's talking to you about weed, it doesn't seem so cool anymore. <laughs> well, that's it. And uh, I know you know, quite a few lovely old ladies who very much enjoy their weed. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh, so did you have any other points you wanted to bring up uh, on this issue? I didn't know. No, that's uh, that's pretty much my my argument. Um, I uh, I used pretty much all of those principles to come up with the Liberal Democrats' cannabis policy, which is uh, I believe still the only uh, we're still the only parliamentary party to have anything further than oh well yeah maybe we might let people who are already really really sick try it. Yeah, you know, uh, we we are the only. Party who are willing to come out and say, look, this doesn't cause anywhere near as much harm as some other substances in society. It should be legal. And, uh, you know, we're going to do everything we can to make it illegal. Not, make like, it legal. A, Again, not, like, those, not like those drug control greens. They, um, <laughs> they no, like... no, well, it, the greens are, are quite interesting. You know, if, if you asked, uh, you know, 10 Greens voters, uh, at least nine of them would say, yeah, the Greens want to legalise cannabis. But if you go and have a look at their policies, no, they don't. They uh, you know, explicitly say we do not favour the legalisation of any currently illegal substance. There you go. Pretty cut and yeah. dry. Yeah, so, um, so I guess uh, I want a question for you is um, in the, you know, with Colorado and and I, I think um, now California's made pretty... Uh, there are so around 20 US states now. 20, and, right. uh, you know, several other countries around the world. Uh, Uruguay springs to mind. It, it definitely has a its time element to it now. So I guess i wanting to um, get your prediction. Like, how long do you reckon it's going to take for Australia to... Um, to go down this path that a lot of other similar countries are now going down? Oh, look, I think we're probably still at least five to ten years away from it. Our, our governments are notoriously conservative in terms of anything like this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've only just managed to get same-sex marriage across the line. Yeah. You know, and it was starting to get really embarrassing. Yep. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's probably still five to ten years away. If you get more Liberal Democrats senators elected, then it <laughs> might uh, bring it down a bit. Uh, it's looking like we're going to get beaten by uh, Saudi Arabia there at one stage. Yes. Um, <laughs> Saudi Arabia beats us to uh, cannabis re-legalisation, then we'll know we're really in trouble. <laughs> that's right. That's right. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on the um, on the show and for your article. So, no um, problem, mate. Uh, I'll put a link to the article so everyone can read it in full. Thanks Excellent. again. Excellent. Thanks, Justin. See you, mate.